Hi, guys. So we've got an interesting one today. We've got Nigel here, who's a geologist of 32 years, uh, extensive experience exploring all over the world. So thanks very much for joining us, Nigel. My ah, pleasure, mate. Nice to be on, Jordan. Let's yeah. get straight into the topic of this video, mate, uh, and we're going to talk about drilling. So why, as geologists, do we choose to drill? Oh, mate, as geos, we have to drill. Um, we've got to prove ourselves um, worthy of our salary and we can just, you know, we can think about geological models, mineralization, and it means nothing until you can actually prove it. And the way to prove you're right or whether there's mineralization or whether there's an ore body down there, you've got to drill it. There's no way around it. You can, you can surface sample, you can trench, you can do geophysics for as long as you want, but until you drill it, it just absolutely means nothing. So drilling, it really is the, the end game of years of exploration and it proves whether there's something there or not. And that's it. So we've really got to, uh, companies that don't drill have something to hide. <laughs> that's basically it, mate. You got to drill. And you know, when, when, when you drill and there's nothing there, um, you've got to move on. You know, as geologists, we got all wrapped up in our own, um, pet projects and we just really got to you know bite the bullet and say you know i've been working on this 10 years and uh, we drilled it nothing there time to drop it and move on if you don't drop and move on and you know go on to the new ground as an explorer you, you never get anywhere you know you're never going to discover anything and that's really the end game of uh, drilling is make a discovery make a mine yeah sounds um exactly right mate it's it's a shame when you you see companies just get really bogged down on the one project and instead of moving on and testing multiple targets, they'll just focus on, on one project and, and you, yeah, it can really, um, can really look bad and, and kill time. And yeah, if you're an investor and you, you also have a bit of a geology background, you can sort of identify this and, and then, yeah, maybe give that company a flick, but, um, yeah, exactly right. You've got to test what, what you have and yeah, the, um, the way to do that is by, by drilling. So, how as geologists do we come about picking drill targets? What other, what are the um, methods we use before we start drilling a target? Yeah, it's. I mean, what what was drilling is you know the is the end game. You you've got to, you've got to do a lot of um, groundwork to justify drilling something. Um, sometimes people companies jump into drilling too early, and they drill in the wrong place, and then you get a negative result, and they. You know they've been the project without actually doing enough groundwork. So you got to do your, your your mapping, your sampling, your geophysical surveys, and it's a bit like um, you know it's a bit like a jigsaw. You need all those pieces together, put them together, analyze it, create your targets, justify your targets. You know, get uh, other geos in, geophysicists or whatever, other consultants, and say you know this is our target. Does it stand up? And when you're absolutely sure and you've got the money to do it you've got to go and drill it. So there's a lot of background in there, a lot of work to be done. And, you know, that's it. You, you drill it and you know you've got the, the the best target and you've drilled it and it's like, yeah, hit or miss, you know, stick or twist. Exactly right. You, you can't rush into it either. Like I've seen a lot of a lot of companies just burn money in the ground by, by rushing into um, drilling a target when, they probably should have done some more groundwork and just accumulated all that evidence before diving in. Um, yeah, so it's Absolutely. it's crucial to just yeah do that do that work first. Have a um, be able to explain the target that you're going to drill really clearly, um, and yeah, and then move into what method you think is effective to what drilling method you think is effective to test that target. So let's talk about some of them. Uh, what would you use yeah. for first pass? drilling to test a target so basically the most cheapest method what would you um what would you go with obviously it depends on the ground but um uh, let's say you've got a you've got a target there you've identified from geophysics and all the evidence and geochemistry and trenching and all that what would you what would be the next step yeah you've got you that that's crucial it really is um you know if you're in in, in WA in Australia, you can get away with, you know, just rab drilling, just geochem drill, uh, RC drilling, dead easy. Uh, you've got the space, you've got the access, it's flat. And I I, I, I always like to go in uh, with like a, an, an RC or um, 
rab or something like that first because the way I see it, RC drilling is a bit like butchering and then core drilling is more like a surgeon. So, you know, you, you want to prove that the, the there is mineralization, there is a depth. You've got a chance of uh, discovery creating an economic um, economic deposit there. Um, yeah, once you prove that, yeah. It's yeah, literally so all about... Sorry, mate. Just it's just all about just speed as well. That's what um, investors need to realize that the different speeds involved with drilling holes from these different methods. So if we go through RAB or air core drilling, um, moving to RC to diamond drilling, that's basically a um, a time a timeline of uh, the speed of drilling. So the quickest way to get information if the ground is suitable for the type of drilling is to RAB or air core because um, basically, you move into um, basically those types of drilling are only effective when you're drilling through clay or what we call regolith in the geology world. Um, you can't drill through hard rock with those types of methods. So they're basically just a um, it's just a blade that spins through the earth and ch like churns through the clay and then yeah. um, sends sample through compressed air up to the up to the surface and it's the cheapest way to go about things have you done much air core rub drilling in your time Matt? uh i have done rub and air core um not a great deal um i've done a lot of rc drilling when especially when i was in oz or, or, or in africa um since i've been here in 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 latin america south america it's predominantly core drilling and that's not because of uh you know funds or availability it's just that you're up in the andes and you can dismantle a core rig and get it up there whereas you've got no chance of getting an rc rig up there and when you're five thousand meters you you know you, you're really not getting the pressure and if you get water um you know it just causes problems so um yeah rab, rab drillings for young people you know if you're drilling 800 meters of uh rab a, a day you know you've got your you're running around after the rig and the rig's moving on to the next place, you know, 250, 350 meters a day in RC drilling is good. And then, you know, 30 meters of, uh, of say HQ core drilling a shift, you know, that's pretty good going. So like you say, it's the speed of things, you know, the fast, the cheap, the first pass drilling, rab, air core, uh, then onto RC, which is more, more accurate, bit slower. And then onto the most accurate, precise drilling which is the most expensive uh which is core drilling so it's a it's a staged approach yeah very um interesting point about that i didn't actually realize uh until you just said it using compressors up at altitude in the andes is it an issue so using rc drilling to drill out some of these huge porphyries you see up in the andes do they they use that approach at all uh, even like maybe for pre-collars or or, any, or anything like that or is it just all predominantly diamond drilling it's it's predominantly diamond uh, core drilling. Yeah, um, the, the 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 downside of core drilling is you need you need water, you need good prepared pads, and when you're up at, at altitude and it's winter, you know your water freezes, so you've got to keep your water supply absolutely spot on. Your RC doesn't need so much water. Uh, if you're up at five thousand meters, obviously the air you, you really need an auxiliary and booster. Do a pre collar down to 150 meters, case it off, and then di uh, diamond tail it. Uh, that's probably the best way to do it. Um, you know, face sampling RC bits, RC hammers, dual core, uh, dual tube. Sorry, they're really they're really accurate. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd put a lot of faith into it. Um, so you know, those guys do the pre collar and RC, and then finish it off with diamond tail. And you've got to drill deep at porphyries. You've got to go a kilometer deep. Um, you know, it's still in mineralization. You see what's been happening out uh, in Argentina. You know, the oh, yeah. <laughs> kilometer of you know a percent copper. <laughs> it's it's just go insane, eh? Hey? It's like it's yeah. another world. I haven't worked in that sort of field before. I've just done all my exploration in Western Australia, where you have sometimes up to like 150 meters of just clay and soft regolith before you hit any hard rock. Um, yeah. But yeah, th this this story up in Argentina, I've been following NGX. They um they basically stepped out from Philo Philo de Sol, the yeah. uh, discovery a couple of years ago um, of a huge I think it's a 
by sulfidation um, epithermal to a, into a porphyry. And yeah. then they basically stepped out, followed this structural target uh, off that deposit, and then with their second diamond hole, without doing any other exploration in that area, they nailed this incredible um, incredible result of, of basically hitting another porphyry, what, what looks to be another porphyry, uh, with the second hole they planned. So that's a, that's a success story from just using diamond drilling off the, off the go without any other um, cheaper method of exploration, which I thought was very interesting. But I suppose it's the only way to sort of discover these porphyries is just to sink these big, deep diamond holes down to a kilometre in the first phase of drilling. Yeah, yeah, you have to do it. And, you know, the, the good thing is that's what's going to move your share price is is is, is drilling. Um, it can crash your share price because <laughs> the assets don't come back as well as you hoped. But uh, and that's where people sort of start using equivalents rather than just, you know, reporting copper or gold or whatever. So is that you, so? You, Do you want to talk about yeah. that a little bit, mate? So yeah, give, we'll us, get give us a little rundown that. of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's pretty it's pretty pretty ballsy moved, you know, to 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 hit off um, you know, coring program from the get go. Um I'm sure they've done they've done a lot of other work. There's, they've looked at geophysics and, and and the geochemistry. You've got to get through the litho cup and you've got to get through to the good stuff underneath. And you know that takes money, it takes patience, it takes access. <laughs> What's the um, typical thickness of the uh, the litho cup in the Andes drilling out those porphyries? Do you do you have a Ooh, number for us there? Yeah, you can. Oh, uh, you can be up to a couple hundred meters of litho cup if it, you know it's a true litho cup if it's you know, if it's all preserved there, you can have 10 meters, you can have 100, you can have 200, you know, it just depends on uh, what, what's what's left there, what's eroded. Um, yeah. So, you know, get through that and then, yeah, call, call, call down to a K. All right. I bet you missed my beautiful voice in this episode so far. So I had to make an appearance. And of course, I'm making an appearance to tell you about today's advertiser. This is the company, one of the companies who pays the bills of this channel. Uh, and it's called Awale Resources. They are currently drilling as well as they recently finished a 5,000 meter drill program with assay results expected this month. So maybe you can use that company as a live sort of case study to apply what you have and will learn in this episode. The ticket symbol is ARIC on the Ventures Exchange and their project is in the Ivory Coast. It's one of the largest land packages that I've come across recently. It's almost 2,500 square kilometers. It's completely underexplored and there's many multiple ounce, um, multiple multi-ounce gold, though it's hard to say, many multi-ounce gold deposits in the surrounding area. And um, part of this land package is now also partnered with Newmont, where Newmont is paying for their exploration on their ODA project. So um, the 5,000 meters I told you about, the company didn't have to pay for it themselves. Newmont did. And that will likely be the case for next year as well, because Newmont is still showing confidence in this exploration play as they recently increased their ownership in Awale to now well over 15%. So with a market cap of under $8 million, Three confirmed discoveries to date and the potential for two more discoveries in the upcoming assay results later this month and multiple pipeline targets ready and financed to be drilled next year. Again, this could be a good example of, or, or a case study for people to look into. But you should also understand, of course, that this is, again, an early stage exploration company. So it's not going to be for everybody. There is a lot of risk involved and you will have to head over to setterplus.ca to read up on the official filings and consult a professional investment advisor before taking any decisions in the end, unless you like m losing money, that is. In which case, uh, you might be in the right sector. But at the same time, the casino might be more fun. So please just keep that in mind and let's go back to the video. Let's take it back to drilling out resources. Which drilling method are you going to use to drill out a resource? Yeah, it depend, depends on, I guess, the deposit type, the setting, the geology. In coal, you know, you can probably drill every 200 meters just using RC. You know, it's going to extend out. You know, whether if you, you know, if you're going to drill out a deformed VMS, uh, you probably want uh, directional drilling. You want some uh, core in there. Uh, but once you sort of get a hang of how the mineralization in the ore body sits, you know, you, you, you can step back. And once you understand it, you can say, OK, we don't need to core drill every single hole. Um, we can infill it with RC between these two core holes, as long as it you know, stands up to the jork um, 
uh, prescription of Jork. Uh, as long as you can put a resource to it, it's 43 101 compliant, Jork compliant, that's fine. It's, it's what does for each individual deposit. Yeah, um, exactly. One uh, thing I want to highlight between these different drill methods we've got here, so let's go back over them. So we've got Aircore, which is your, your uh, first pass sort of approach if you have soft regolith at the top of the um, at the top of the uh, in the clay zone, and then you've got RC drilling, which is a little bit more expensive again, but it still it uses compressed hair, basically drives a big hammer into the ground, and then you move into the most expensive, which is diamond drilling. And that's just basically um, it's just a coring. So you, it's a spinning hydraulics that um, is perfect for accuracy and getting the highest quality samples to add into a resource. But I just want to highlight that when I was working in West Australia, and I don't know if you've seen anything like this before, but I've actually seen a resource being, an underground resource being drilled out with, an RC rig before. So basically a whole heap of RC holes which have gone into producing this resource, which is quite rare because usually if it's an underground resource, you need to you need diamond drilling just for the depth and to get the accuracy. Because RC drilling yeah. accuracy accuracy can go can go anywhere. It's just a big hammer bashing into rock and it's not not super um not super accurate. But if you have a good mm -hmm. driller and a good drilling company it can be deadly accurate. But but I actually saw that in Western Australia which was a, a big thing at the time because it brought the cost mm. of the whole drilling down substantially and they basically punched out this resource for um yeah bugger all drilling costs yeah no it's awesome i mean like like you say once, once you're confident in what you, you what you're drilling you're sort of just uh rubber stamping it um yeah to, yeah it's yeah horses for courses really then there mate yeah. yeah so um yeah i mean core, core drilling's is, is is the ultimate you know you can get so much information from there um you know your downhole survey you can run um you, you you run your geophysics through the rods you can with rc as well but you've got your geotechnical data you've got you know you can cut it so you still remain half your core you can put that in into the the, the core shed and you can come back to it time and time again where the rc you know you have your chips yep they're good but again it's you know it, it they come up to surface, not, they're not in situ where the core is, you know, it's from there, you can orientate it, you can see all your um, your fractures, your mineralization, and you just get so much information from uh, core drilling. But, you you know, all in cost, $350, $400 a meter, you know, you're talking, you know, it's a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, and obviously it's a lot slower. So what's an average... Um... What's an average day for drill, diamond drilling? What's a good sh or one shift? So, how much call would you get for a one shift of of diamond drilling? So, yeah, you know, I, I sort of work on about 30, thirty meters a shift. Uh, a shift being eight, say eight hours uh, to twelve hours, depending on the law, whatever. Uh, and that's HQ, uh, NQ, which is a smaller, smaller uh, diameter. Uh, you could, you know, get up to sixty. Uh, PQ, which is again bigger than the HQ. Uh, if you're getting anywhere sort of like 20, 20 meters a shift, you know, you're, you're pretty well going. It's just as a rule of thumb. Depends on the ground. You know, if it's all broken, you can get jammed, you can get the water blocking off, and you've got to pull and trip out and clean it up, clean it up. Um, but you know, you, yeah, you, 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 can, you can get good, good drillers and bad drillers. So you can, you know, if you get a bad driller on a, a diamond rig, you know, you can waste a lot of time and, and money. Um, I, I, I've worked with some exceptional RC drillers in, in, in WA up in the, in the Pilbara, and they could nearly sort of uh, directional drill it, you know, just putting on the, the, the pressure on the bit, speeding up the rotation. They could, you know, they, they could pull it back up. They could drop it. Um, so it just depends on the, the training, the level of training of, of, of the driller, which is, yeah, very variable. <laughs> it's so important to have a good driller on um on your program you're drilling as a geologist it's 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 critical to getting um yeah basically getting results and moving through programs at speed and not getting bogged down if you have a good driller there's always a um i don't know i've worked with a lot of different drillers there's always a little bit of a clash between geologists and drillers you're fine because 
yeah, they always kind of push back on on one another. But at the end of the day, the goal is still the same. It's let's drill as fast as we can. There's nothing worse than um, when you get a a driller though that comes in and just basically throws safety out of the door and then hammers uh, drilling as fast as he can, like really working his offsiders who are his helpers on the rig. They're called drillers offsiders. Uh, and just hammers them all day to exhaustion, and you're you're there as a geologist monitoring the rig, and you're seeing this happening. And it's your it's your job, especially if you're working for a big company, is to step in and and control the situation, and then then you can get, get some uh, confrontation going with the driller. But yeah, I don't know yeah. if you've had any experience with that, mate. But that's a that's a classic geologist uh, driller chronicles, I guess. <laughs> no, absolutely. Uh... I, it, as a junior geo especially i i loved drilling i absolutely loved it and if you could get on well with your driller you got the best out of the driller they got the best out of you as well um you know a driller wants to drill you know 20 50 meter holes every day laughing and then you say no no we've got to go through this and yeah we've got to go through that and yeah it's going to be slow you're not going to maybe make your bonus today but you you might tomorrow it's 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 a two-way street um and I, I would encourage every geologist, young geo as well, it, it, is to learn about drilling. I I, I could strip down a hammer, SDS um, hammer up up in the Pilbara, and I watched the geos. I watched, uh, sorry, the drillers, the offsiders, how how they changed it. You could listen to the rig and understand what was happening with the the compressor, what's happening down hole. You knew where there was a problem as well as the 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 driller did. Um, and like you say, if you get a bad driller um, for you as a geologist, um, it, 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 they can ruin your samples. You know, if, if, if they're just drilling down a, a rod and just opening the, uh, the splitter every, every meter is that if, if it's flying down and then they pull off the bottom after the rod and you see all your sample come up, you think, well, you know, the, the previous six samples have been absolute rubbish. It's all contaminated. You haven't, you're not really sampling, you know, at, at the face of the bit it's all just getting clogged up on the outside of the drill tubes you you know it's it's awful so you really as a geo you have to understand the physics and and how machines work and if you get involved you actually turn out to like it I, i've i've drilled a couple of rods and uh, absolutely loved it i won't say who for <laughs> I say, didn't mate, get if, if I ever yeah. mentioned that, one of the yeah. one of the companies I worked at, the last one, they would they'd straight away fire me if you say you went any <laughs> went anywhere near drilling a rod or something. <laughs> Health and safety. <laughs> yeah, but um, you know, dr drilling has got a lot safer now. Uh, there's no running rods. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's there's cages that go around the the rods when they're spinning, and um, you know, blow off valves, and it it, it has. Uh, it's a lot safer. But again, you know, if you, if you get a driller who who encourages people to take risks, you know, you, you're drilling with rods that spin very, very quickly. You're drilling with compressed air that can expand and blow out your lungs, you know, if, if you're not careful. So you do have to be on your on your game all the time. Um, but as a geo, you, you force yourself to get on with the drillers because that act of drilling, your job could de depend on it. You know, if you if you hit a duster and, and there's nothing there, as an exploration geolo geologist, you're, you're the first guys out out the door. You know, when when the recession comes and the prices drop and or whatever, you know, say, well, that project's dead. You're out the door. So you have really got to uh, be be on your game. The geos are working in in the mines. You know, that they're in the mine. They've got the resource. The company's making money. They're very unlikely to get get the flick. Exploration is always the first to go in times when times get tough so you've got to be on your game exactly right it's um yeah. it's very important to to realize this when when you are working in an exploration team um, but like you said the, the relationship between geologists and drillers is so important and quite often i've noticed over my geology career is you get these guys coming straight out of university with these shiny honors degrees or phds um and then they're put up with a driller to start off in the industry and they just don't get on together at all and i think it's like if you're looking you're doing research in a, in a company and you're seeing these geologists with these flash credentials phd honors first class all that um it doesn't necessarily mean it's a 
it's a good thing for that company to be honest uh it's it's yeah. there's a lot of stuff that happens outside of that like these relationships with your contractors which is so important to a company no I, I, absolutely i think um i'd much rather have a non-honest student as a geologist on a rig who's got good people skills and of course here we are in latin america language skills which is so Un, un, under you know no no one pushes language in, in geology and it's absolutely critical you know geo said to me oh nigel can you get me a job out in in in, in peru and i said oh, well do you speak spanish no 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 it's okay no i said no <laughs> you need to speak spanish you know that's their second language english might become third or fourth and as, without speaking spanish you will never ever get a real job as a field geologist in, in Latin America, you just, you just won't, how are you going to speak to somebody? You know, if you, if you, if you can't speak to your driller in English in, in Australian, in Australia, let's say, you know, how are you going to do it here? Uh, people skills, people management uh, is so, so important as a geologist and um, you know, your, your attitude as well, you, you know, just, just be, just be yourself, be, be humble. You know, there are a lot of people skills, um, as for being a geologist we were doing esg before it was called esg we were doing that <laughs> now that now they've created esg it's okay you're an esg people geos were doing it decades ago um because they they run projects they run companies they run regions and uh, we were doing all that and it, it is part of a geo's job what do you think are the main uh things to watch out for on releases from companies regarding drilling what are some of the important things to to note yeah pre press releases and, and and drilling information can can be very misleading unless you really sort of you know sit down and go through it what you've got to look out for especially is you know when somebody says oh drill hole collar from to intersection assay you've got to know if that's a a true width um, or an apparent width. You have to look at uh, the assays, their collars, whether these guys have actually produced a cross section that shows all their drill collars, um, you know, the, uh, the, the collar AMGs, whether they've released the assays as a, a an equivalent or they actually break it down into this is the percent or ppm copper gold zinc because um i'm not a great fan at all of equivalents i i think people use equivalents just to make the number bigger to make it look interesting um i think there should be a, a disclaimer maybe there is that if somebody says oh we've got a 0.6 uh copper equivalent in this intersection you think okay what's in the equivalent is it two elements is it 10 uh, so you really, as a you know, a, a, a non-geo, as a potential investor, you've really got to drill down because they can be extremely misleading. Um, yes, you know, buyer beware. You know, th th there's a lot of pumpers out there who just you know who will just spew out all these numbers, and for the un uninitiated or the, the people who don't look hard at the numbers, will be misled uh, themselves. You know, so you, you 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 do have to understand it. Look at the drilling method. Is it RC? Is it PXRF? You know, people are putting you know XRF numbers in there. You know, is 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 that altered? Um, especially with you know things like lithium, it's it's complicated. You know, metallurgy. You've got to look at the metallurgy. Um, so yes, press releases. Look at them very very carefully and understand every single. Bit that they 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 they're reporting on. Yeah, exactly. Um, with where you can find out what type of drilling is uh, has been used, it's a quick one. You can just check the whole ID, and usually at the end of the whole ID, they have the abbreviation. So it'll be for um, air core drilling, it'll be AC, RC drilling will be RC, and diamond drilling will be DD or DDH. Uh, it's just a quick way to check on a geological cross section. All the, these geological cross, cross sections should always have the whole ID and then just see what method's being used and make sure that trace is realistic too. So the trace of the drill hole 
is exactly um, what it is. So with these different drilling methods, holes can substantially move as they're drilled. As I said before, when you've got a big hammer bashing into the ground, it's never dead straight. So diamond drilling is the most accurate and that's that's why it's the most expensive pretty much. And RC drilling, if you have a good driller, you can get really straight holes, which is of course always the aim. And um, what what happens with these two methods of drilling, they send down a survey tool to take a survey every interval that the hole is drilled. So it would be like 30 meter intervals. I think that's what we used to do. Um, and then they record the direction of the hole as it's being drilled like that. And then the, that information comes to us, the geos, and we, we are basically tracking that as that hole is being drilled. So we know exactly where it is and if it's heading towards the target, which we want to uh, intercept. So that's a very important thing to consider when you're seeing a release is make sure that trace of the drill hole is representative. Um, I've seen RC holes that have just completely kicked right out of like the, the drill has just hammered it and it's just gone into oblivion yeah. upwards. Uh, and then you get the survey back and you're like, geez, listen, you've basically got to cancel the hole. So um, that'll hardly ever happen with diamond drilling. Diamond drilling is basically dead straight. You can, you can almost guarantee that it's um, it's a slow method and, and it's super accurate. And if they're off course, you'll, the drillers will come to you and, and let you know and everything. But with RC drilling, they they just want meters because that's how they get yeah. paid. So they, they will try and almost deceive you as a geo just to get those meters in the ground. So if you see these holes going off into oblivion, you've got to you've got to make a call as a geo. You've got to say, that's not going to test our target. You've got to cancel the hole or you drill it and then um then just work the work the trace in to get whatever geological information you want out of it. But yeah, it's uh it's one to look out for on the releases. Make sure that hole trace is representative of the hole drilled. Absolutely. It's um I, I I've I've seen press releases before. Um They've got, you know, they've published these wonderful drill results. Then you look at it, and then you look at they've they've all started sort of a hundred meters away, but they're all, they're all going to the same target. <laughs> Ridiculous! So it's, it? Oh, that's wonderful, but they're basically essentially just redrilling it's just it's the same target. It's got the exact same assays. It's it's basically got um, get, you haven't got any information. They've just blown a whole heap of money. Uh, yeah. Bear in mind, geologists geologists do make mistakes with drilling as well. I've been uh, guilty of this. I've got the uh, when you when you plan drill holes as a geologist, you set a dip, so the the um, the angle at which you want the hole drilled, and the azimuth, which is the reference um, azimuth, which is like the reference in a three sixty degree circle. So I've uh, printed out a drill program, and I've I've mucked up the dip and the azimuth, and of course I've drilled some holes that have literally crisscrossed each other <laughs> the aim is to obviously test your body in you know consistent lengths to get as much information as you can down dip of that um across your body but I'll, i've actually i've actually crisscrossed some holes so yeah. guilt, shame on you mate. I've, I've never days, done mate. that oh jesus i should <laughs> expose no, myself I, here. I was um yeah very sorry for that i remember seeing it my heart just sunk i was just like Oh no, we're drilling in this tight corner of a pit, an operating pit, and we had a limited time to get in there. And I was just rushed in there with a drill rig and, and just belted out these two holes. <laughs> <laughs> Gone the wrong way. That's uh, a carton, sorry. mate. <laughs> oh, carton. I thought I was going to lose my job, but yeah, lucky it was, um, <laughs> lucky it was a major company, not a junior. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. They can, they can absorb those. Yeah. They can absorb yeah. it all right. Yeah. Uh, well, no, yeah. What else we talk about drilling wise, mate? It's it's yeah. one of those things well, where like it's 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 just such an interesting factor of being a geologist is is drilling because it's a huge part of your job is understanding what drilling is. Like when you first come in the industry as a geo, you've basically got to go and learn the the trade. I think you've just got to focus on how a drill rig works and and yeah, um, it's it's very important to to prepare for if you want to go down the path of working as a geologist is you're going to be standing next to these drill rigs which are as loud as a jet engine uh they're dusty you gotta wear a mask all day you're usually drilling in 45 degree weather if you're in western australia uh in the outback of western australia or freezing cold conditions in the on the top of the andes um 
yeah, what are some other things with drilling we can we can help really investors understand? Yeah, I, I think um, like like you say, dr drilling is the epitome of or the goal of every geologist, and every, a, a geologist who doesn't like drilling or take an interest in drilling is is an academic. Is not you know that that's it. it it's it's drilling is the proof of the pudding of everything that you've um, worked for in, in in that project, and you know you just hope fingers crossed that everything works out and you make a discovery, and I, I think that's the what, what one of the main things I I would take away from this uh, this interview is you will never ever make a discovery without drilling. That's it. So. You, you you have to drill and if you drill and it's not there move on um and, and and with drilling because it's so expensive you know if if juniors don't have the money they can't afford to drill uh that that's tough that's that you know it's a tough break but when you do have the money you must drill and you must assay properly you must choose the right assay spectrum you know for acid digest blah 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 and We'll get on to the next thing now, which is so important, is, is the the amount of data that drilling generates is, is enormous. It's huge and it's so valuable. Now, so many juniors, you know, sort of like, oh, oh, oh yeah, we didn't hit it. You, you, you've got to store that data on a database, have a proper database management system. It's it's all there. You, you, you probably spent millions on drilling and, you know, that's your... The, the value of a junior, let's say, is in its intangible drilling database. You've got millions of dollars tied up there and you can make a deal on it. You know, BHP might come in and say, well, you know what? You've, you've drilled this area. We'll pay you three million bucks for um, your drill database. Let's share that. So it's never wasted, even if you might have drilled duds. You know, as they always say in drilling, you know, if you drilled here and there's nothing there, well, the deposit isn't there. It's you know where it isn't. You know, it's another place. So your, your drilling data, the GCM database is so valuable and you should always look after your data, make sure it's clean. Somebody might just come in out of the blue and say, well, let's have a look at your database. And if it's all over the place and it's in PDFs, it's not stored correctly, you know, you might miss that, especially when people are looking at lithium now. No one really sort of looked at lithium or rare earths for ages, but all those geochemical analysis we're always there and so if you can access it and you know hand it over to someone you're, you're at the head of the queue you you'll get that deal and you'll survive and you'll live to fight another day so looking after your drill data your geochem and your geophysics databases is is so so important i i can't stress it enough yeah it makes makes perfect sense yeah exactly you've um yeah obviously these things can be worth millions the amount yeah. of money and like if you if you haven't tested um that drill target if you if you've got some geological information from geophysics or geochemistry um yeah so if you've got holes that can explain what that anomaly is from that other exploration information then that's value in itself even if it uh doesn't re doesn't return anything significant we got to remember what numbers we're dealing with here when we talk about discovery one in 1000 uh exploration uh projects become uh, an operating mine so it's extremely mm. rare to get onto something economic but if you have some information there that points to um they're likely uh they're likely being an anomaly or something that needs testing that that drilling is the only way you can basically um put a put an end to to the question you're, you you want to answer so yeah Drilling is everything for uh, a company and for geologists. No, absolutely, absolutely. It's um, it's worth mentioning as well that um, a, a lot of junior geologists are thrown out onto drill rigs. Thrown out. Well, they go onto drill rigs, and yeah, yeah, off you go. But I, I, as I've got older, I I always think that the most experienced geologist should be on the drill rig. And and they should teach the young people. You shouldn't just put a young geologist out there because they might miss something that through just their inexperience, uh, they may, might miss something really key. So you should have your, your your most suitable geologist on the drill rig 
at all all the times because it is it, it, it defines it can make and break a company and that experienced geologist should then teach the younger geologists um you know that they, they, they might miss some kind of alteration they might miss d veins in in core or something like that um or or whatever so drilling is really really important to so get your best people on the drill rig don't just give it to numpties and um always have a geo on the rig i mean ge- drillers can um you know they can look at the uh the color um they they they, they can they they've got a feeling when you're in in the mineralization they they pick up on things pretty quickly so you can learn a lot from from drillers but um yeah always have a an experienced geologist on the rig at all times one thing you don't want to do as a geologist is end a hole in mineralization because once you move off the location that you're drilling the hole um, it's much more expensive to come back onto that hole run down and drill it and if you're drilling something like uh, rc drilling it's very hard to run down but it can be very hard to run down those holes who knows what's happened to that hole since it could have fallen in it could be yeah. um it could be something in the way the driller doesn't want to risk re-entering that hole because of whatever ground condition reasons so if you if you end a hole in mineralization as a geo it does happen uh but it's it's just something you don't really want to see if you're looking at a <laughs> at some results and you're the geo on the rig where you've just got this like bonanza or just some grade at the end of the very last sample of the drill hole um yeah there will be questions asked what what did you see in this and then likely your boss will go over look at the drill chips if they see something that could indicate mineralization there and you've ended that <laughs> hole you can be in trouble <laughs> yeah but it does Absolutely. happen um because yeah it, basically what happens at the end of these drill holes with um air core drilling and rc drilling and of course diamond drilling uh you go out to the drill rig if you're drilling air core and rc there's always the geologist on these rigs basically all the time uh geologist is monitoring these rigs all day it's his job to go out there for 12 hours and look after the rig and make sure no holes are ended in mineralization basically and make sure you know the drillers are doing the right things safety wise okay. um quality of samples are good so it's very important so um basically dr- the driller will come over to you at the end of the hole though or uh, you'll have to go and sieve a pile of dirt take it back to the ute or the the truck that you're working on have a look if there's any indication of mineralization there drill another rod and you just go you just look over the driller bang drill another rod please um and then just you want to be absolutely sure that you're not ending holes in mineralization very important to to note and of course if you see um some results released uh, in an announcement and you see that the, the last hole's got uh mineralization in it yeah there's questions that you'll need to ask there uh let's what are they going to do about about that how they're going to follow that up but yeah basically the job yeah. is to make sure you've um yeah you've drilled through your target and you don't end a hole in mineralization no, absolutely you're dead right you know if 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 i see a hole ended in mineralization it's it's like okay they must have run out of rods <laughs> you know that's it if in doubt go deeper uh, like you say you know it's uh, it, it's not if a company says oh it's, it ended in mineralization blah, blah, and, and it's a teaser it's not it's a screw up it's or, or, or there's a very good reason why it, it, it stopped there um it's exactly even right. now, yeah e- e- even now with you know laptops and you know all, all that kind of stuff i have a hand-drawn paper section with me in the u all the time and i update it because i think well oh, hang on you know that 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 lithology shouldn't be there so you're always referring back to you know uh plan your drill and drill your plan that's you know that's that that's the you, you've always got to do that you've got to change things on the fly sometimes you know you say oh that that was unexpected that bit of um uh biff or willy wally formation wasn't meant to be there it is there oh there must be a fault in there okay that changes the whole model okay let's drill deeper let's find out what's in there so always be on 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 you know on top of your game. Understand you know what your section is meant to look like, what you are planning to uh, intersect. Um, yeah, crayons and pieces of paper still have a place in today's uh, dr- drilling in the twenty first century for sure. The funnest part of being a geologist, I reckon, is getting this picture in your head of what you're drilling, um, of what you're drilling is is doing uh, in terms of mineralization. So you basically, yeah, you just have a have your color pencils you have a a3 piece of graph paper and you're there sketching in what you're seeing with the with the rocks your litho boundaries your mineralization um yeah and it's 
it's just a, a very still a very important uh, part of exploration, even though we've got all this technology now. I think it's you know, old pen and paper uh, geology yep. still got a still got a big place. Um, back to let's go back to air core drilling and rab drilling because that mm. is that can really send the results from these can really send a share price to the moon if they have good hits. So basically, how it works is the air core rig is coming along testing multiple targets. It's just it's just moving really fast and it's drilling holes into soft ground. So it'll the the, the rig will stop drilling as soon as it hits fresh rock. Yeah. And then let's say you do hit fresh rock, the, the rig will literally max out. It won't be able to grind anymore. And it will the driller will look over to you and say that's the end of the hole. If you get a sample coming back that looks good, um, what you can then do is put a hammer on these air core rigs and have it operate like an RC rig, so you can come back down the hole and just hammer away for a bit. These hammers are not super powerful, but they can they can test the rock um, for a few meters if they like. It's it's a slow method, but it's um, if you're like I said, if you're ending a hole in something that looks like mineralization in an air core rig, you can always go back down uh, and put a hammer on and bash through and test what you've got. So if you do see uh, results come back at the bottom of an air core hole, so we'll have an AC abbreviation on it um you can actually test further into the fresh rock with an air core rig but it is very slow drillers hate doing it uh but it's a way to to test um if you see something that looks good there as a as a geologist and i've done a lot of air core drilling it's a super effective no, yeah. way of just basically hammering a tenement and testing all these little anomalies you may have from soils or or geophysics, uh, super effective way, but it, yeah, it doesn't work all around the world. I, I assume it won't work in where you've got regolith and transported cover, so that's Western Australia and West Africa mainly, and obviously through um, through some parts where you've got uranium deposits and, and soft um, soft sediments. But yeah, it's it's a it, it can really add value to a stock is results from air core drilling. Have you had any experience with um, with that before, Nigel? Yeah, air core. Um, I've only ever done in WA, um, but I've had experience of it. Um, we we were drilling out in this well near the South Australian border, and I think it was Permian that was um, uh, glacial deposits, and we were air coring down. It was fantastic, just a vertical hole, blah blah blah, and bang, hit hit rock. Okay, yep. case off, uh, change over to diamond. Um, did all that, let it set. So we sort of came back the next day. We drilled 30 centimetres and it was a boulder and we went through it and went back into the soft sediment again. Oh, so we geez. was we were stuffed. We had to, uh, uh, you know, core drill from that point forward. So, yeah, you've got you've got to just, uh, yeah, you cho choose your, your your drilling technique or drilling method uh, to, to the ground conditions. But, yeah, if, you, if you're drilling in old and deeply weathered terrain, Rab and air core really does. You 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 can blitz tenements, and uh, you know it's just like you know it's a geochemical sampler. Basically, you can drill hundreds and hundreds of meters a day. But it's good, you know. It's uh, it's representative. Um, there's not that much contamination based on the you know good driller bad driller scenario. Um, keeping the splitter clean, uh, you know, or, or, you know, you've just got to keep your QA QC going. And uh, Rab and Air Core are th thoroughly decent methods to um, explore with, yeah. Yeah, besides um, auger drilling, which is another one that you just have a on the back of a ute goes around and it's basically like soil sampling. It just punches a little tiny hole a metre or, or two thick um, into the ground. Not super effective. Uh, but, yeah, at least with Air Core drilling, you can, you can punch through the regolith and the cover mm. and until you hit that fresh rock. And then if you want, you can put the hammer on and you can test a little bit of that fresh rock which is of course in western australia where you've got your ancient rocks um it's buried by yeah a shitload of shitload of weathering and and cover if you're out on the fringe of the yulgan where i was for a mm. while where you've just got sometimes you've got up to 150 meters of tertiary cover before you come into regolith and then you come into fresh rock so Air Corps is super effective in the likes of Australia. And yeah, a lot of these companies on the ASX, it'll be their their first go-to uh, drilling method for for testing their their anomalies and, and their areas of interest. Yep. 
Absolutely, yeah. You know, transported cover. Uh, if you've got, you know, Namibian Kalahari sands, you know, you've got transported soil in, in WA or black cotton soil in parts of Africa. It's the cheapest and quickest way to get through all that into the non-transported in situ stuff underneath. And um, yeah, Rabin Air Corps is fantastic for that. Absolutely. Well, mate, I think we've covered a lot there. Uh, thanks very much for joining us today, mate, and taking the time. It's been it's been really good. I think a lot of investors will get uh, some information out of this and help them understand what geologists are thinking when they when they um, choose a, a different drilling method and uh, yeah, and what those what those reasons are. So yeah, thanks very much, Nigel. Appreciate it. Ah, pleasure, mate. Pleasure. Anytime. Okay. Cheers. Take it easy, mate.